It's estimated that there are more than 168,000 people living with stage four breast cancer in the United States. And although they can often live for many years with the disease, we need every tool to keep it controlled for as long as possible. And now, clinical trial results will open the door for new treatment options for patients with metastatic breast cancer. A recently FDA-approved TDXD is a medication that improves outcomes and extends survival to a new population of patients. And we're gonna talk about it right now. Hello, I'm Dr. Diane Reedy Lagunes from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and welcome to Cancer Straight Talk. We're bringing together national experts and patients fighting these diseases to have evidence-based conversations. Our mission is to educate and empower you and your family members to make the right decisions and live happier and healthier lives. For more information on the topics discussed here or to send us your questions, please visit us at mskcc.org slash podcasts. Our guest today received a standing ovation at a national medical meeting after presenting the groundbreaking results of the Destiny Breast 04 trial. Dr. Shanu Modi, medical oncologist and the principal investigator of this MSK-led trial, is here today to discuss the results and tell us what it means. Dr. Modi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. It's really my pleasure to be here. We're so thrilled to have you. So before we get to the heart of the study, can you just share with us a little bit about what HER2 status really is in regards to breast cancer and why for this particular drug it's so important and why this drug may be a little different? Yeah, happy to do that. The background is actually really critical, I think, to understanding this new trial. So in breast cancer, we have generally defined the HER2 status of cancers in a very binary way. So you're either positive for this protein or you're negative, meaning the cancer is positive or negative. What it means to be HER2 positive is that this cancer has a lot of this protein on the surface of the cells and that makes that cancer behave more aggressively. It is a driver, we say, of that cancer. And on the other side, we have wonderful targeted therapies that are extremely active against these HER2-driven cancers. So we call those HER2-positive breast cancers. Everything else we call HER2-negative. So you can imagine that the HER2-negative group is a really mixed group of breast cancers, actually. And the one thing that we've always known is it's an oversimplification to say these are all HER2-negative cancers because actually many of those cancers do also have low levels of that HER2 protein present. But it's been a frustration that all of our really excellent HER2-targeted therapies have not been effective at targeting these HER2-low breast cancers. And so we've always treated patients with this type of breast cancer, HER2 low breast cancer, as if they are HER2 negative and they are typically treated with chemotherapies and they don't have a lot of targeted therapy options. And then comes along trastuzumab drexican, also called as TDXD for short, which is this new generation of HER2 targeted antibody drug conjugates. And it's just changed the whole field based on the Destiny Breast 04 trial. So essentially this drug is able to bind those small amounts of HER2 expression in this patient population? Exactly. So it is what we call a HER2 antibody drug conjugate, which means it's composed of an antibody, which is actually trastuzumab, or Herceptin is the other name. A lot of our breast cancer patients will be familiar with that. It's been a groundbreaking drug since it was approved 20 plus years ago. And it's an antibody therapy, right? So its job is to find HER2 and attach to it on the surface of the cell. But what's happened is they've linked this trastuzumab antibody using a very special linker with six to seven, eight molecules of a very, very potent chemotherapy drug. That's Deruxtecan. So now when trastuzumab or Herceptin binds its HER2 target on the cells, the whole complex gets internalized and it really just dumps the chemo right inside the breast cancer cell. And even these little low levels of HER2 now we're finding this antibody drug conjugate can bind to and target successfully. And this is the first HER2 targeted therapy that's active for HER2 low breast cancer. Amazing. So again, just to reiterate what you said, I like to tell my patients it's like a lock and a key, right? There's some locks on the cell. There's not a lot of them, but they're there. And now when this key binds to that lock, the key also has a little tiny bit of chemotherapy attached. Right. And is able to dump that chemotherapy, as you said, so perfectly right into where it matters, right into the breast cancer cell. So it's truly miraculous. 
Can you tell us what did the study actually show? Right. This was a big randomized global phase three trial. It was open across three continents. In this study, we enrolled patients who had HER2 low advanced stage breast cancer. And so these are patients who had had at least one, but not more than two lines of chemotherapy. And if they were also hormone positive, HER2 low, they'd had to exhaust all the, the active endocrine lines of therapy as well. And standardly, what we would offer these patients would be single agent palliative chemotherapy. So that formed the control arm of the trial. The, the typical standard chemo drugs these patients would normally get and then the experimental arm was the trust use mamdroxicam. And it was a randomized trial. There was actually a two to one randomization, so there was two out of three chances to get onto the TDXD arm. And we followed these patients to see how long we could control their cancers with either therapy. And what we ended up showing was that there was a very statistically significant and also I would say a very clinically meaningful doubling basically of the control of the cancer with the trastuzumab drextican. So it was really impressive data. And I think that was our primary endpoint we say of this trial, that was the main purpose of the study. But we had multiple secondary endpoints, you know, other things we were interested in. And one of the key secondary endpoints was overall survival. Do we just control the cancer, do, but do we also have an impact on the long-term survival of patients? And it's not that common to see a survival advantage in sort of a late-line metastatic breast cancer setting, and we saw that as well at this early time point in follow-up. We saw that there was a one-third prolongation also in the duration of time that people lived taking this therapy versus just standard of care therapies. So it was very exciting to see that. So as you said, the alternative standard to this therapy was palliative chemo. So most of these patients have exhausted all therapies for the treatment of this disease. So I'd like to hear from Allison, an attorney from New York who has been benefiting from TDXD for more than a year and the impact it's had on her. Hi, I'm Allison. I'm a lawyer living in New York City with my Chihuahua mix named Daisy. I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer nine years ago, and it's been a roller coaster for me being on different treatments over time. I was fortunate a year and a half ago to start taking TDXD, which has been a real game changer. For me, it's been wonderful to be on the same drug for that long, to feel hopeful, to have more time to live, to work, to spend time with family and friends and do the things that are important to me, and to do it all with mild side effects. I'm just really grateful to be on this drug and to be feeling really good. I hope it'll be made available to many other cancer patients. Amazing. So Shana, you've been saying that this was clearly a practice changing study and Allison's an example of that. Anything else to add on why this may be so important, not only for metastatic breast cancer patients, but potentially for even other patients? Yeah, I think you just hit the nail on the head there. This trial is positive, but it's also more about progress in cancer therapy. I think what we've shown is for the first time, we can actually target low level proteins on cancer cells. This is something we haven't been able to do very successfully in the past, certainly not in breast cancer. And so I think this kind of sets a new paradigm, right? Now we have the ability to maybe target other proteins, enzymes on cancer cells that we haven't been able to do before. So this opens up, I think, a whole avenue of cancer research. And this is important, not just in breast cancer, but all different types of cancers also. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I care for, for example, colorectal cancer has this expression too, and there's certainly potential there to use a similar type of approach in these patients that have HER2, but just, again, not a lot of locks on the cell, if you will, but now you're able to identify them and go after them to be able to get this treatment right to the cancer cell. Right. What are the side effects of this particular therapy? Anything additional or anything we need to know about this particular drug? That's an important question. Most of the side effects from this therapy really do probably come from that targeted chemo component. The most common types of side effects are generally either of a gastrointestinal nature or bone marrow suppression, meaning nausea was the most common side effect we've seen with this drug, but it's a very controllable kind of nausea. The other main sort of day-to-day -day toxicity is the lowering of the blood counts. Again, this is something as oncologists we're really familiar with managing. 
There is one side effect that's really important to mention. It's not a common side effect, thankfully, but it's an important one because it can be serious in some patients, and that's lung toxicity. We've seen that in almost every trial with this particular drug. There are different degrees of the lung toxicity that patients can have. Thankfully, most patients will have a low-grade, mild lung toxicity if they have it in the range of you know 10 to 12 percent, and that's reversible for the vast majority of patients. Unfortunately, for some patients, it can be a more severe toxicity. And I think what we've learned with this drug and all the trials we've done, the key is education and awareness. Because if you are aware of this potential risk, you can intervene early. The key is for your doctor to hold this therapy. So I'm optimistic as people get more and more familiar with using this therapy, we're going to continue to see the, a decline in those high-grade lung toxicity events as we've already started to see. As you know, the drug did receive FDA approval in early August. So what are the real-world implications? Do you think this will be considered standard practice, not only at MSK, but beyond? So yeah, it was very exciting to see. I have to say it's probably the fastest response I've seen to a new drug. I want to credit that standing ovation a little bit for that. It really put a fire under people's feet, I think. We saw the NCCN guidelines actually react almost instantaneously to the data. And they incorporated trastuzumab drexican as an option in our, in our national American guidelines within two weeks of the release of the results. So this is now a drug that should be available widely in the United States. And now the next step is to get it available to patients around the world, frankly. Absolutely. So, you know, many of our patients with stage four disease know that ultimately they're going to succumb to the disease because we haven't figured out how to cure it yet when it spreads. What do medications like this mean? And, and how many patients are we really affecting by adding this drug into the toolkit, if you will? So HER2 low is expressed on almost half of all breast cancer. So we really are talking about a large population of patients here who have the potential to benefit. And it's really important because, as you said, we recognize that curing stage four breast cancer is still eluded us, but this is one step closer to that. That's always our goal. Every new therapy we hope is going to push the needle further and prolong survival. But ultimately, our hope is that one day we can eradicate this stage of disease. Absolutely. I don't want our patients with stage 4 disease to ever forget that. This isn't good enough. We're not content here. We're always saying we're, we're trying to run faster than the bear for new therapies to come up and be able to ensure that our patients are living longer until we get the new, next therapy FDA approved. We are trying to move away from the one-size-fits-all and really try to personalize therapy for patients. And this is one, I think, step towards that. I'm always optimistic that there is something great just around the corner. Uh, it's just our job to find it. Amen. Dr. Shnu Modi, thank you so much for all that you do for really doing very heavy lifting to make sure that this drug actually got into the clinic for our patients and for sharing your insights with us today. It's really my pleasure. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for listening to Cancer Straight Talk from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. For more information or to send us any questions you may have, please visit us at mskcc.org slash podcast. Help others find this helpful resource by rating and reviewing this podcast at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Any products mentioned on this podcast are not official endorsements by Memorial Sloan Kettering. These episodes are for you, but are not intended to be a medical substitute. Please remember to consult your doctor with any questions you have regarding medical conditions. I'm Dr. Diane Reedy-Lagunes. Onward and upward. Onward and upward.